I, Tori Podmajerski from Microsoft, is going to be talking to us. Hey everybody, I am Tori Podmajerski. I'm a UI writer from Microsoft. I worked on Xbox, I, wor I shipped Xbox One, and have moved on to work on X uh, Microsoft Account and services related to Microsoft Account. And today, I'm here to talk about Keep Them Playing. Now, what is UI text? Some people are a little fuzzy on this, and I want to show you a spectrum of all of the things that we write, and especially that people read, to show exactly where UI text hits, because that'll take us where, uh, where we need to go in terms of, well, what should be in that bucket? What goes there? And for that, I'm going to tell you about these two cars, very briefly. My husband's car is this 1972 Triumph GT6. It doesn't run. Well, y you can get it started, and then there's this fountain of gasoline, and it's a super hazardous experience. I, I have this Chevy Spark. It's 2013. And we have very different things that we read about these cars. So, and our, our customers, whoever reads our documentation, reads for very different reasons. My husband reads to study. He needs to know everything there is to know about this car. He needs something, he needs documents with all the terminology, all the analysis. He needs it to have great depth of accuracy and precision. He also needs to investigate, you know, why is this happening? He needs that academic approach. He needs the clinical pieces. He also needs to get verification. He goes to the forums. He reads up on why is this happening or will this window seal work for this model even though I can't get it anymore and it's not the right thing. He wants promises and examples. If we fast forward over to the other side, I want to do, I want to use my car to drive to a thing and get the thing done. All I want is indicators. I don't ever want to think about what I'm reading for my car. Or I want it done for me, right? Notifications, things like that. And it's on this far side that our UI text lives. We have, we want to just indicate. We want it to be invisible, we want it to be intuitive. I have permission when I'm writing UI text to do some step-by-step -step instruction. To, to fail to make assumptions about where people are, or where they're coming from, and just explain, hey, this is what needs to happen. But I also have permission to go to this other side a little bit. But most of it should be instantly forgotten. So if it's instantly forgotten, why have it there at all? Well, three reasons. There are only three reasons to use words in your UI. And this is what I tell teams that I'm working with, and they sometimes come to me, and they have these user interfaces that have lots of explanation about how this product is going to be great for them and why they should do it, and all of the things that the engineers or the marketers think they need to know to go through it. And I say, which parts do these things? Which parts do they really need? Let me talk a little bit about the playing. I said that I worked on Xbox. Um, playing in Xbox is about gaming, right? It's about being entertained. But I want to talk about playing as experiencing this state of mental flow. Sometimes we are playing when we are working, right? I'm a, not only a technical writer, I'm a fiction writer. I'm definitely playing. I'm in that state of mental flow when things are just happening right. And when you're playing, you want just the words that make sense to you. You don't want to be interrupted by, by any of the extra things. So let's say it's 2008, you're on a PC, maybe you're gaming, maybe you're playing, maybe you are writing your great novel that's about to come out. And then you see this. You're in your state of flow. This is a slide, by the way, I didn't just crash. <laughs> I just, I just want to put that out there. <laughs> this was planned. I'm not freaking out. 
If you look at this, we've taken them from whatever they're doing, and maybe, maybe they hated what they were doing, whether or not they're in this state of flow, whether or not they're playing. Sometimes bad things happen, and we have to break the experience. But is this going to help them? Raise your hand if you ever saw this in real life. Raise, keep your hand up if you ever read it. Yeah, some of you, because you're work people. Yeah, not the rest of you. Um, maybe, who knows when this one came out? I was not on the Windows team at the time, so I don't remember. Yeah, Manette? 2011, this came out. I want to break this down for you in terms of what it does. This part keeps them playing. In fact, we've taken it a step farther. They don't even need to press a button to restart. It will, after a period of time, restart for them. But not without notification, right? We are going to keep them playing by restarting their computer for them and telling them about it. We are going to ease the way. This is very important. Sometimes just doing it for them or keeping them going isn't enough. Maybe there are, there are unintended bumps along their path. So we tell them, I'm sure you can't read this, you can search for the error online, driver or equal, not less or equal, storaxis. So we're not just giving the error code, which some people know they can look up online. We are telling them, you could do this thing if it will make sense to you and be helpful to you. And then, the thing that this screen got an awful lot of press for, we establish brand. We recognize that even in our error messages, and sometimes especially in our error messages, we're reminding our customers who we are, right? We're saying, here we are, and on the old blue screen of death, it was, here we are, we're super technical, we know all this stuff, and we're gonna be super wordy at you. That's not a great brand promise, right? That's not like, boy, I hope somebody will come be super wordy at me today. But if they take away that we're at least trying to be empathetic, that's pretty cool. So I, I kind of went like straight to the hard screens, like these are clearly UI screens. But UI is all around you all the time. And in fact, in Portland, um, in my current experiences, bathrooms have a lot of written UI. So if you can see this one, there's the ease the way. Did you guys see this in the bathrooms here? Yep. This one uh, Michael took at a, a restaurant called Peacock Thai, or Thai Peacock, one of those, down the street, and it's in the bathroom. You, when you're in the bathroom, maybe it's not mental flow you're after. <laughs> Potty humor works well in this room. <laughs> but we do want people to be able to keep doing what they intend. And that's all that it's all about, is respecting customer intent. So here's another example. This is from Nordstrom, which is a premium department store in the Northwest. Um, and they are very brand aware. The bathrooms in Portland, not very brand aware. <laughs> right? It's, well, our water will burn you, and we know our lock is tricky. Nordstrom, very brand aware. And in fact, most of this message, which is from an app, uh, it's their, actually their app down message. When their service is down uh, for overnight uh, maintenance, this, and you go, try to go to their Nordstrom app, you'll get this whole message. And they're doing a really interesting thing here with their voice. Um, anecdotally, I have learned from one of their UX writers, Ellie Searle, that they're going for unexpectedly witty. Think about how hard that is. Oh my God, I would like to be unexpectedly witty in my day-to-day -day life, but in error messages? That's hard. 
So this is where they're going. And they ease the way. They know that they can't keep them playing right now, but they can say, you can come back at this time and it will work. So how do we get the words right? Let me start really big, very philosophically. Every UI is a conversation. The interaction of your customer with the thing, whether they're pressing a button or clicking a link or filling in text in a field, they are talking to your product. Every piece of text on the screen is them talking. Is I just got really confused there. Lots of pronouns. Do you get what I'm saying? Okay. You're talking to them, they're talking to you. Okay. Now, some of us in like nursery school had this training about how conversations work. Some of uh, you have kids who needed this instruction of like, here's how a conversation works. You say what needs to be said, you don't just keep going and going and going and talking like you're four years old and you have a lot to say. And you say it out loud, right? You don't make it be implied or everybody understands that. You also take one thought per turn, right? You say something, you convey an idea, and then you wait for them to respond. You also end the conversation gracefully so that both parties know it ends, and you're kind. Here's, here's an example um, from a UI that I currently work on by influencing through others um, of something that is not particularly kind. This is, let me give, set the context. You're trying to sign into your Microsoft account and you click the link saying, I forgot my password or reset my password. And it says, why are you having trouble? Now, if you're sitting in a conference, right? If you're sitting in a conference and you're not in a particularly agitated state, you might be like, oh, that's fine. And certainly when this was written, it felt fine in conference rooms. When you're in agitated state, um, this is, why are you having trouble signing in? <laughs> I forgot my password. And, and the things that we give them to choose from, to, to respond to us in the conversation are like, I forgot my password. I know my password, but I can't sign in. Right? It's all, it's very defensive. So we are giving, we are saying a thing. They're going to hear it in a certain way. They, we are giving things for them to say. And it, it's, it doesn't feel quite right. We can be kinder. Um, this is a rewrite that I'm currently advocating to go into code. It's hard. Where we can say, which part is, of our stuff is giving you trouble? And, and we still have, I forgot my password, because it turns out that a lot of people use that language. But it won't accept my password is much more the, the customer side. Someone else might be using my account, right? Like this is, do you see the difference? Okay. Now, I'm gonna let, get a little pedantic. Only use words to fill a necessary purpose, taking up only the space required so that people will understand, be informed, and or act as desired. Right? But I think I can say that better. Now, nobody needs these extra that's. Uh, let's see. I can say only using the space required. I don't really need to say be informed and or act, right? If they understand, they'll act the way they want to but really that whole thing sucked. I can say it better. Make each word earn its place. <laughs> you guys are so nice. Um, this is redeem a Microsoft gift card. Now take a look at this part. 
By redeeming this code, you expressly consent to the full value of the Microsoft gift card or code being added to your account balance and acknowledge this means you lose your legal right to cancel this purchase and get a refund if such a right to a cooling off period applies in your country. Your other legal rights are not affected. This transaction is subject to the Microsoft gift card terms and conditions. I'm pretty sure that this says, we're going to put money in your account. There's no refunds. And it's subject to terms and conditions. Right? So we should just say that. And I've found that if you catch your attorneys, if you have corporate attorneys like we do at Microsoft, if you catch them on a really good day and parse it out for them and say, do you think this is defensible? And they go, I'm going to check on that. And it turns out that they often would much rather have their legalese be readable. And it makes it actually more defensible. I am not a legal expert. Please don't take that as legal advice. Okay, here's another one. Use words that contribute to the desired emotional state. You can say that better too. Use words that set the mood, set the right mood. This is a screen that I worked on a lot for Xbox One. When you are signing in to an Xbox One for the very first time that has a Kinect sensor attached, it will look at you, it'll look at your living room space, and you'll see yourself, and you've, it already has enough information to put a little flag over your head and say, is this you? This section, it was right in the middle, I'm zooming in, says, sign in when Kinect sees you, before you pick up a controller or remote control without even turning on a light or putting down your sandwich. Now, this is not only legal text, but regulatory text, privacy policy text, because it is telling you that Connect can see you in the dark and recognize you and your motions, right? Because you can control it before you turn on a light or put down your sandwich, right? But does this feel better than saying a bullet, bulleted list, Connect can see you in the dark. Connect can recognize you in the dark, right? A little bit better. The privacy is really like legal, but with a posse. And, and I tell you though, they love it. They're like, we don't want to be creepy and make people think it's not fun. We just want them to know. So if you start with why, if you start with telling your customers why this is good for them, and you know, there's a bunch of other text on the screen. There's a button you can press that says how Connect works. There's other things that went into it. That was important. This one, check that the words scan without effort. Scanning is important, we know that, right? Um, what's even more important is that they are easy to read. This is the interior of a Boeing 787 Dreamliner. It is super cool inside and it's enormous. This is actually one a uh, photo taken inside one at the Museum of Flight in Seattle. You can totally go there and walk through it. It's awesome. Uh, when I was there, I took a picture of this door that's, that's behind us there. Um, and it has this placard on it. Um, oh, and if you work on UI a lot, raise your hand if you do this too. You start seeing UI all over the place and taking pictures of all of it. Yeah, I see hands. Oh, yeah. Okay. So this placard, visually ensure the mode select handle is fully inside the red placard for armed and green placard for disarmed. The hell? <laughs> I'm pretty
pretty sure this is what it means. And I, and I looked at the, the thing with the handle, and, and my picture isn't good enough, but there is no indicator other than the red and green color that it is red or green. Like, they didn't even write the words red and green. Like, seriously, low-hanging fruit, folks. But no. No. Okay. This one should be good, right? Use correct grammar. Throw your tomatoes now. How about common grammar? Actually, screw that. Use what gives the best result. Test it. Test it, test it, test it. Just like the, the what was the name of it? Like Magnavox remote control. If you're not testing it, you're not gonna do it right. This is a screen. Um, that you really can't see much of at all. But the important part is that it's got user pictures from when you've signed into your Xbox One, when there's many sign-ins, and you go to the sign-in selector thingy, and it asks you, who do you want to sign in as? And here's a true thing that happened. I got an email two weeks before ship. Um, this, is, this is an excerpt of it. Who wrote this? It should be whom. And we can't end sentences with as. <laughs> yeah, Midnight, you're shaking your head. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, uh, and I, I totally used the Active Directory, and I'm like, who is this person? And it was a... a tester on a team that I've partnered with a lot in the past and I'm like okay I just don't know this one person but I respect the team and these interconnections super important right you're like I'm gonna check this person out are they just crazy no every indication was they're totally not crazy they just care a lot so here's what I said in short thank you for caring whom and as aren't my job I did not get into arguing with her about the grammar, because that is not going to go well. They're just not my job. What I do is use language to guide our customers where they want to go. The screen, it was test, the hell was tested out of this. We knew that it worked. We knew it got people going. Now, why have I been doing this crazy thing with the red text and everything? Well, it's totally a trick, right? You're paying attention. But um, I want to point out that there's an enormous amount of reworking that happens. I don't think I've shipped a single word that hasn't been reconsidered and rewritten and redone and examined. And well, no, some of it didn't get testing. Then we learned. Now, everybody? No, not even. Because not everybody is going to agree. But all your stakeholders need to at least be willing to go out on that limb. Now, where do the words go? We need to decide that together with our designer. We need to write as the design emerges. They need to design as the message changes. And we get results like this. I can clearly not take responsibility for any of this. This is a really, their messaging, spot on. Their design, great. There's a lot going on here. I'm going to break it down a little bit. Um, I'm speeding up a little bit because I think you're holding up my five. Yeah? Okay. Um, notice that this is all inside the F. And in that, they're establishing brand with the food truck in their pants. They're keeping them playing. Right? Very easy to choose which app you need. They also keep them playing in this bar. And they ease the way with help in the corner. Now, we know that sometimes the problem is with the other people I work with. How do I get it right? And this is a theme that's emerged, right? We need a seat at the table. 
we have the writer and the designer, maybe, and, it, and this is like for a big company, and I know that smaller companies may not have all these people, but they have all these things that need to be done. There's planning, funding, researching, coding, marketing. Together, you're shipping. You can let them know that you're there to help. And you can not just tell them, but you need to demonstrate it. You show up and you say, internal terminology, whoa, we're calling this CSV? What does that stand for? Currency stored value. Pretty sure that means money. Can we call it money? Oh, we can? Okay, good. Um, we need them to help focus on the customer, like Jody and Arthur said yesterday. It's not what's the use case, but why would a customer use this? And the mood, like if you've got, if you're meeting with engineers and they're embarrassed because a thing went out and it was broken and people hated it, and they're defensive and they're feeling bad, they're going to write defensive error messages. They're going to be like, what, it's totally your fault. If you were smarter, no. Help them adjust their language internally, and it'll help them uh, when the product ships. And how do you get to do that? Well, you build their trust. You ask questions like, hey, what's the value to the customer, and what's the value to the business? Show them you understand the purpose of what you're shipping, and keep yourself informed about it. Research your own answers. You know, if you don't know the, the right words for it, say, I need to look into that, and then follow up, right? Speed is of the essence. Responsiveness. You need to advocate for great outcomes for your customer and your business and the engineering team, like the, the what's in it for me, the with them. We need to do that. And we need to let them see our awesome selves. Now, this is a screen um, that I don't think I have time to tell you about. But if you ask me later, I'll tell you something about Dr. Seuss, and it's really funny. But instead, I'll tell you about these buttons that I've been handing out, and I have, I have this many left. Um, and I'll, I'll give them to you. Um, words are work. And several people I've given them to are like, words are, but I have fun with it. And there's a little disconnect there. And I want to say that's very true. You know, words are work for us. They're awesome work. It's fun work. It's creative work. It's work where we get that sense of flow. It's work worth paying for. It's work worth getting right. It's work worth caring about. It's a big responsibility. It's also work that's difficult. It's full of ambiguity. I mean, have you seen the English language? Uh, it's often contentious. Everybody thinks they're a writer. It's often underfunded, understaffed, underappreciated. Now, words are work for our customers, too. They want to learn, they want to know, they want to do. They want to keep playing. The more words we put in their way, the less playing they get to do. So keep them playing. And thanks for all you write.